Welcome to part three where we start looking at uh, individual firm cost curves. I've actually made these videos slightly shorter than I did the macro ones, um, but it probably means we're going to need more of them. But anyway, let's dive in before we wait too long, and um, now it gets exciting because we're going to be looking at uh, individual firms and their cost curves. Okay, when I say it that way, it doesn't actually sound as exciting as I thought it would. Oh well. Let's draw them anyways. These, by the way, are incredibly important. There's a lot of detail to them. Um, but as with all of our graphs, it's really price and quantity that we're going to label here. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that we could come about deriving this, but I'm not going to go through the whole derivation of how we came up with these individual cost curves. Um, but I'll hopefully talk about it a little bit. Um, I think I'm going to start with... Um, well, probably the, I don't know, I don't even know which one I want to start with. Let's start with the most important one, the marginal cost curve. Um, the marginal cost curve, initially you can think as I'm starting to hire workers and, and start producing, um, I always use pizza as my example, if I, if I have a pizza shop. Um, I'm of course going to have some fixed costs, and we'll come back to those. But if I want to start producing, um, i got to hire a worker, I got to turn the ovens on. I've got to, you know, do a lot of stuff just to sell that first pizza. So that the the cost of going from zero pizzas to one is actually pretty darn high. Um, but as I start producing, you know, I can get more a little more efficient. Um, I probably should have started a little lower, so I'm going to start a little lower here. Uh, I can get more efficient, and my cost can actually go down as I start producing more. But at some point, I start running into the law of diminishing marginal return. You know, I can produce more and more and more, but I'm going to have to hire more workers. They're going to get in each other's way. Um, there's going to be some more downtime. I might have to have a bigger delivery area, which means my drivers are out of the store a longer period of time. Um, there's lots of things that are going to actually make my costs eventually start to go up if I want to produce more. Maybe I'll have to be open more hours of a day when it's less efficient, um, I might have to pay overtime, etc, etc. So eventually my costs of trying to produce that next pizza are going to start to rise and really this marginal cost curve is the one that's going to drive um, all of my other curves. Um, a lot of my students like to say it looks like a Nike curve or a Nike symbol which sure go with that. Um, the next one, though, that I need to look at is is uh, the average total cost per pizza that I make. If I make one pizza, well, I gotta include all my fixed costs, so the cost for my building, um, divided by and plus all the variable costs, you know, the worker and whatnot, divided by the one pizza that I made. So it's incredibly, incredibly high. But each of these pizzas that I'm making is costs each additional one costs less than um, than my average total costs are so it's actually going to drive my average costs down oops um, I can draw that a little bit neater than that and so my average total cost my average total cost per pizza is going to go down and down until it gets to this point where it hits the marginal cost curve at that point my next pizza so maybe my I don't know 200th pizza here is actually more expensive than it's cost me on average to make them. So of course if that next pizza is more expensive than the average it's going to start pulling the average total cost back up. And so I'm going to get my average total cost. Now my average total cost includes fixed costs. Um, but there's a third really important curve in here um, which you'll see come back in a moment and it's the variable costs. If I take out the fixed costs, like the the amount of my, uh, again I use my building as my example, the thing I'm going to have to pay whether I open my store or not. Um, if I look at just the variable costs, that curve is going to be below my total cost curve, and it too is going to bottom at, at that point, because the only costs going into the marginal cost curve are variable costs. So once the cost of that next pizza is higher than the average variable cost has been, um, average variable cost will start going up. And again, maybe I should clarify that um, average variable cost is like 
labor and the cost of electricity to turn my lights on and that kind of stuff. But anyway, as that price goes down, eventually it's going to start going up and it gets closer and closer and closer to the average total cost uh, because the fixed costs, again the cost of my building and whatnot, uh, is actually, is actually uh, dropping per pizza or per item that I'm making. Um, if I had a thousand dollars in fixed costs for the day and I make one pizza, well, yeah, it's a pretty large cost portion of my total cost. But as I as I if I make a thousand pizzas, well, then my the cost of my building is really only um, one dollar per pizza that I'm making. So my fixed costs. I don't normally draw this graph, this one in the graph, but um, the average fixed costs are then going to be really the difference there and they're going to get lower and lower um, oops not variable fixed cost um, again one not that one that we don't normally need and I'm not going to draw again so I'm actually going to pull it off of there these three curves really drive um, the rest of the rest of these graphs so what I'd like to do is look at a bunch of different scenarios and draw all of those graphs. The first scenario that we're going to look at, um, of course, is perfect competition. And what do we mean by perfect competition? It means there are lots of people in it. Um, there are, sorry, lots of businesses, lots of uh, probably small uh, people in the same business. So you could think of um, pizza isn't maybe perfectly example, but let's let's go with farmers. There are lots of farmers, and they all produce essentially the same thing. Um, and it's easy enough for anybody to get started. There's not huge barriers to entry, although that's maybe not entirely true in farming. Um, but anyway, perfect competition doesn't actually exist, but we get relatively close to it in some cases. It's more of a theoretical thing. Um, but if there is perfect competition then no one firm has a very large impact on the entire market and so the firms end up taking the market price so we'll look at the the whole market demand and the whole market uh, supply and that will give us the market price and the market equilibrium quantity which I'm actually less uh, less important to me because what I really want is that is that market price as I'm gonna label it P sub M um, as an individual firm you know I've got those cost curves right I've got my marginal cost um, I can sell as many as I would like at that market price so effectively the that I'm facing um, is at that market price. So in this case, demand equals the market price. Um, we could also say that demand is the average revenue. Um, uh, per item that we, we sell, it also equals the, let me slide this over just a little bit, um, it also so price equals the average re revenue it also equals the marginal revenue because each additional one that I sell I'm gonna sell at that same price so the revenue that I get from each additional one is the price um, and because they're all gonna be sold at the exact same price the average revenue that I'm gonna make per one that I sell is also that price so the demand curve really equals all of those things um, now if my, so I've got my marginal cost curve there, I am going to always want to produce, and this is kind of that big rule of thumb that you got to keep in mind, we always produce until marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Um, the reason I always produce to that point is as long as my cost of this next one is less than the revenue I can get from it, I might as well keep producing. You know, I might not make as much on... Um, on this item as I did over here 
but I'm still making some money, so I might as well produce it. Um, so if what it looks like for economic profit would then would be if my average total cost curve, I'll draw it like that, is actually below uh, the price that I'm selling it. So this is this is the quantity that this firm is going to produce. That's that profit maximizing quantity. And the actual profit is then would be take this price. Um, this is the amount that it's costing me per. Let me do this in a different color so that we can see it a little better. This is the price that I'm selling. That's my equilibrium. Um, this is the amount per item that I that it cost me to make it. And so my profit is that quantity times that price. There, let me write that in there. There's profit. Um, that quantity times that price minus, of course, the the cost to me of that producing that quantity. Um, so my profit maximizing point is always at that at that point right there. I probably could have done a little better job drawing it. It might appear, and it probably would be true, that I could actually produce slightly more efficiently at this point here, where my, um, let me, no, I don't think I can redraw that, uh, but you, you know that this point right here where the average total cost equals the average or the marginal cost, that's my lowest cost per unit. So that might be my uh, most efficient production point, you know, right there where it, because it started going back up at this point. Um, so that might be my most efficient point, but that's not my profit maximizing point. If I produce a few more, although my profit is small per item on each of those and, and ever shrinking, uh, it, it is increasing my overall profit. Um, now, one very important thing that I should say about this is that this right here, when I say profit, what I really mean by that is economic profit. We're assuming that I've I've included in this cost, in these costs, the um the opportunity costs that I have for running this business. So I'm earning like a profit that's above and beyond a normal economic profit. Let me hang up on that phone call a second. Um, so where was I? If this was the case, if we had a economic profit, I guess the real question then becomes, you know, what's going to happen then in the long run? Well, in the long run, Perfect competition assumes, so I'm going to actually redraw exactly where we were, as best I can, where we had our equilibrium price and our uh, equilibrium quantity, our market equilibriums. Um, what's going to, oops, undo that. What's going to happen in the long run is that we are going to, this is perfect competition, there's going to be, um, there's easy entry into the market. And so what's going to happen in the long run is that more suppliers are going to be like, hey, they're making above average profit, above normal profit. Um, they're making more than I could have done in something else. And so I'm going to switch my business and I'm going to start doing what they're doing. And so the total market supply is going to increase. And so the new market price is going to be lower than what the old market price was. And of course the equilibrium quantity, the total produced, is actually going to go up because we've got more producers. But what does that look like then for, oops, uh, what does that look like for me, um, individual producer, well, I still have the same marginal cost curve that I had before. I'm still going to produce, just like I did up here, I'm going to produce until my demand, my price, demand 
which is my average revenue. More importantly, it's my marginal revenue. I'm going to produce until my marginal revenue equals my marginal cost. So I'm going to produce till my line is a little bit off, is it not? Maybe I'll erase it and uh, draw it in there again. Should be a little lower, right? Demand equals marginal revenue. Also equals average revenue, but more importantly, it's marginal. Um, so I'll produce until this point right here. So I might actually produce a little less than I used to. Um, I'll put in my labels, P and Q. And what that looks like then in long run equilibrium is that I am making zero. Here's my average total cost curve goes like that. I'm actually making zero economic profit. That doesn't mean I'm not making any money. I am making still a normal profit. I'm just not making more profit than I could doing something else, and so it's not going to entice any more people to, to join the market. Um, let's just keep rolling with this. If the uh, market price had gotten too low, we might have start running an economic loss. So I'm going to draw this one more time. Marginal cost, P, Q, Q. Yeah, slide over there so I can draw my P. Uh, let's draw market demand and supply. You get the idea. You do these things over and over again. A lot of it looks the same. I'm going to follow that same market price over. Um, so that is the demand, that is the marginal revenue. I am going to produce until marginal revenue equals marginal costs. So that's my Q sub E or whatever the whatever they tell you to label it as. Uh, you might label it as Q sub F for the quantity of this firm. Regardless, um, at this point, what we're going to show is at a loss. In other words, my costs are greater than the... So at this point here, the cost to me is greater than the price I can charge. And so I actually have a economic loss. Again, I could still be making money, but I'm making less than normal profit at this point. Or maybe I am, in fact, losing money. The important thing for this to be, though, the not shutting down condition, is if my average variable cost... is, there we go, average variable cost. If my average variable cost at this point is um, lower than the price I can sell it. In other words, I am able to sell my widgets or my pizzas or whatever, my wheat, at a price that is higher than it costs me in terms of hiring workers and stuff. So I'm kind of making back some of the money um, that I would otherwise be losing. Um, I'm, I'm not making it all back, but I'm at least making enough back that it's still worth staying open. In the long term, I'm going to have to either somehow figure out how to lower my costs, um, or I'm going to have to, I don't know, lower my costs so maybe I can drive my average total costs down by becoming more efficient uh, or I'm just going to have to get out from my fixed costs and, and shut down in the long term. The last condition here then, and this will be the last one for this video, is going to be the shutdown position. If the prices that I can get in the market are just simply too low Um, there comes a point where it doesn't make sense for me to even stay open. So let me model that one here a second. Uh, we're going to use the same marginal cost curve. Um, we're still going to be receiving the market price and we're going to 
after I charge everything at the margin market price. Um, so there's demand equals the marginal revenue that I would be making. Um, the problem here is not only am I below the average total cost, but if I if my profit maximizing point is also below the average variable cost. There's my profit maximizing point. That's where those two meet. If it's below there, then I want to shut down immediately because if I produce at this price, my loss becomes a lot greater than simply just paying my fixed costs out of pocket. So this is the classic shutdown position. Now, you're inevitably going to get a couple questions uh, with these graphs. Um, explaining a couple situations and I guess there's one really big thing that I always that I always stumble on um, that I want to that I want to point out so I think I'm just gonna go off to the side here um, I'm gonna have to zoom in a little bit more and and uh, talk about it over here uh, and I'll do it in a different color because it's gonna be kind of a small side note graph Ugh. There we go, black. So let's look at a situation. Yeah, let me undo that. Let's look at a situation where we have P and Q of the market with our market price, our market quantity, and then of course the firms. By the way, anytime it asks for um, perfect competition, you're probably going to have to do a side-by-side. -side. I can't think of many good reasons why you wouldn't have to do a side-by-side -side graph for like your free response questions. Um, and I'll draw a marginal cost curve. Um, here is our marginal revenue curve. Oops. And so, you know, there's our, our, our profit maximizing point. Um, I want to say what would happen in two instances. I'm going to put us at a, so there's my average total cost. I'm going to actually put us at a, a current loss. Um, and I'm going to assume that variable cost is down here, so I'm still open. But I'm, I'm losing money in this scenario. Um, there's two, two possibilities of... Uh, of of things that you know the government might try step in and do. Uh, the first one would be, and so this is, you know, the quantity that I am producing. I call it Q sub F. Um, if the uh, if the government stepped in and said, look. We want we don't you're you're losing money. We wanna we wanna help you out. You know we don't want you to go out of business for whatever reason. Or maybe I have a really good lobbyist um, working for me. So anyway, we pass a bill. If the government gives me a um, if the government gives me a lump sum, so I'm gonna write this down here: lump sum subsidy. They just give me some money to be to stay in business. If that happens, does my marginal cost curve actually shift? And of course, the answer to that is no. The only thing um, that's happened is is that my average total costs have have shrunk down um, because my fixed costs have have. Well, maybe the lump sum is essentially covering some of my fixed costs, but it's lowering my average cost, but I don't actually produce any more than I used to. Uh, a lump sum subsidy doesn't change the cost of my next one. It's just my, it's just my cost. If instead the government had done a... Um, I'll do it... Uh, let's do it in green. Um, the other possibility is that they would give me a per-unit subsidy. Oops per unit subsidy. Again, maybe they want to help my business out and for whatever reason, if they give me a per unit subsidy, well that does indeed then lower my marginal cost for each additional unit, does it not? 
because my next one is a little less than it used to be because I'm getting a um, oops there we go uh, because I'm getting a little bit of a a uh, subsidy on each additional one that I produce um, so here the next one cost me three dollars well now they're giving me a dollar off if I produce that one so it will actually drive that down and it would drive down my average total costs and so if that were the case a per unit subsidy would actually get me to produce a little bit more than I used to I'll call it Q sub S for a per unit subsidy so lump sum subsidy will bring my cost down will will reduce my losses maybe even turn me to an economic profit um, a per unit subsidy will also bring those costs down um, but I will ultimately also be producing more of them so I hope that helps um, again come back more for more later um, I think that's all I she wrote for tonight because as you can see on my thing it's seven o'clock I think I want to go home and get some dinner have a wonderful evening